In the last video, we saw a first attempt to give a definition of convention. And it said that a regularity, a sort of pattern in behavior, is a convention if everybody performs the regularity when they face the same coordination problem repeatedly. They expect everybody else to do the same. And this behavior leads to a coordination equilibrium. As we said, when those things obtain, then a convention holds in the population. However, there are some reasons, as Lewis notices, to think that actually maybe this is not enough by itself. And that in fact, more needs to be required of the expectations of other people before it really can be called a convention. I'm going to, so I'm going to present some of these ideas a bit out of sequence from how they're presented in the text, but I think it will bring them out a little bit clearer. Because in the text, Lewis goes through all this stuff about common knowledge and indication first, and then tells you why it's necessary. I'm going to start by telling you why he thinks it's necessary, and then present the solution. So the reason he thinks that it's necessary to give a more complicated definition of a convention is that, well, when you think about examples that, strictly speaking, are conventions by his earlier definition, but where we seem to have the wrong kinds of attitudes about each other, they sort of intuitively don't seem like conventions or at least there's something important missing in them that we want to characterize. So here's a version of a case like this. So imagine, as a matter of fact, we all drive on the right, but we have very weird ideas about why everybody is doing this. While I think I'm being rational by driving on the right, I think everybody else just does it out of habit. They have no idea what's going on with this convention. They don't pay attention to anybody else. In particular, maybe I imagine that they would do it. They would drive on the right no matter what I did. So in such a situation, I do believe everybody else is conforming, but I think their reasons for conforming are kind of weird, that they're just doing it out of habit. And imagine that maybe not only I think this about everybody else, but everybody else thinks this about everybody else. Everybody thinks that they're the only rational one, and everybody else is just doing it out of habit and would drive on the right no matter what. Obviously, kind of an insane approach, but imagine that we did all believe that of each other. In this kind of case, it looks like there's a kind of sense in which we aren't really coordinated with each other, even though what we're doing is leading to a coordination, coordination equilibrium. And so for this reason, Lewis wants to say, well, actually, when we define a convention, we want a definition that says that this is not a convention. So even though they are conforming to the regularity and they expect everybody else to, and, and it's a coordination equilibrium, there does seem to be something important missing here that our definition needs to respect. That's one kind of case, and that's about what we think about what everybody else thinks. But we can get ones with higher order expectations as well, or higher order beliefs that still seem like they don't, they're not conventions. So imagine it's not in fact true that we think everybody else is irrational. So we don't think everybody else drives out of habit. What we do is that each person thinks that their neighbor thinks that everybody else drives on the right out of habit. So, we, so I have the right opinion about why everybody is driving on the right, but I think my neighbour has the wrong opinion. I think my neighbour thinks that everybody drives on the right out of habit. And imagine everybody thought that about their neighbour. So, everybody, everybody so everybody has the right attitudes about why, why people are actually driving, but they think other people have the wrong attitude. So here it is mutual belief that everybody is going to conform, and it's mutual belief um, that it's mutual belief. But there still seems to be something missing. We have these mistaken opinions about what, every, what about what everybody else believes. Now, we're not mistaken about what other people believe about driving. We're mistaken about what other people believe about other people. But nonetheless, this might be a barrier to achieving the kind of transparency that's involved in coordination and ultimately in, in conventions. As you can see, the sort of level at which mutual belief is giving out is getting higher in each of those examples. And you could imagine further examples where mutual belief gives up at a high, gives out at a higher, our mutual beliefs about mutual beliefs about mutual beliefs is mistaken or something like that, or something higher. And again, Lewis wants to say, obviously the case is going to be more complicated, it's going to be very outlandish, but were such a case to obtain, were we in such a case, we would want to say that it's not a convention. That's what Lewis wants to say. You should think for yourselves about how much you share that opinion. If possible, it'd be good, really good to work out if you could find a third kind of example to go along with the first two. That's that's even more complicated. But think about th to yourselves about whether you think this kind of style of argument is really successful. 
So what we've seen is it looks like not only do we have to conform to the regularity and expect everyone else to conform, but there are certain kind of higher level expectations you might want people to have in order to count them as acting in a, co in a convention. So what might that be? Well, from what we've said in previous weeks, when we were talking about assertion and when we were talking about Strassen, you probably have the flavour of what's going to go on. We need something that's like common belief or common knowledge in the senses that we discussed before. So what Lewis actually does is he introduces this concept of common expectation and defines it in terms of common indication. But as we'll see in a moment, it's very close to the ideas of common belief and common knowledge that we talked about before. So let's say what indication is first. So a state of affairs A indicates a particular proposition to a person, just in case if they had reason to think that the state of affairs held, then they would also thereby have reason to think the proposition held. So a really simple example is like, it's raining, the state of affairs if it's raining indicates to me the proposition that the streets are wet, because if I had reason to think it was raining, I would also thereby have reason to think that the streets were wet. So that's what indication is. It says like evidence for that you're in one state of affairs, thereby gives you evidence that some other proposition holds. It's worth noticing that indication is indication to somebody, because whether something is evidence for something is going to be relative to what your background evidence is. So for instance, in the raining case, it's raining is evidence that the streets are wet because of my background evidence about what happens when it rains. So indication is used to define this notion of common expectation. We should say that Lewis calls it common knowledge in the text. I'm not going to call it knowledge because it's kind of an unfortunate name. Um, it's importantly similar to common knowledge, but common knowledge in Lewis's sense isn't actually knowledge. You don't have to know anything in order to count as having common knowledge in Lewis's sense. So that's one reason it's a bad term. And what, what you have common knowledge of doesn't even have to be true um, on Lewis's definition. So that's another reason not to call it common knowledge. So I'm going to call it common expectation because it's defined in terms of expectation. And I should say, like Lewis does, I'm using expectation and having reason to believe interchangeably. These just mean the same thing. So we'll say that a certain proposition is commonly expected to be the case by members of a group, just in case a few conditions hold. One is that they have some reason to think there's a particular state of affairs, A, that holds. A can be anything. That state of affairs, A, indicates to everybody in the group that everybody has reason to think that that state of affairs holds. And finally, A indicates to everybody the proposition P that they have common expectation of. So common expectation holds for everybody for a certain proposition, just in case they all have reason to think that a particular state of affairs holds. They all have reason to think that that state of affairs holding gives them reason to think that everybody thinks the state of affairs holds. And finally, the state of affairs holding gives everybody evidence for P. That's just what you get when you substitute in our definition of indication into the first thing that I said. So why is Lewis interested in this concept of common expectation? It's not maybe super obvious from the outset, but as we'll see in a moment, if when, so we've defined common expectation in a particular way, if, common, if it's commonly expected amongst a group of people, that P, then it's going to be expected at every level. So everyone's going to expect P to obtain, or everybody's going to have reason to think P obtains, but it's also going to be the case that everybody thinks that everybody has reason to think P, and that everybody thinks that everybody thinks that everybody has reason to believe P, and so on. So actually it's going to follow that if something is commonly expected in Lewis's sense, then it's going to be mutually expected at every level. I'm going to leave the task of explaining why that is to the next video, and I'm going to wrap up this one by just sort of circling back to the original cases we started with. Because once you, if assuming this fact that when you have common expectation that you have expectation at every level, you can then see sort of what the explanation for the cases at the beginning is supposed to be. What's gone wrong with the first case? Well, what's gone wrong with the first case is we don't have common expectation. So remember, the first case is the case where everyone thinks everyone is conforming, but I think everybody else is conforming out of habit, not because they expect everybody to conform. So in this case, we have mutual expectation, but mutual expectation gives out at the second level. 
it's not the case that everybody expects that everybody expects. Because I think that you have some false beliefs about why everybody is driving on the right. So if we stipulate that convention involves common expectation in this way, we will rule out that the first case is a case of convention. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to say that the first case wasn't a case of convention. And so adding common expectation in is going to do that. Let's now think about the second case, which is supposed to be a counterexample to the original definition of convention. So in this case, I don't have false opinions about why everybody else is conforming, but rather I think mistakenly that other people have false opinions about why everybody is conforming. I, in particular, my neighbors, or it might just be everybody. In this case, again, we fail to have common expectations, but it's because mutual expectation gives out at a higher level. So here it is mutually expected that everybody drives on the right, and it's even mutually expected that it's mutually expected that everybody drives on the right. But it's not mutually expected that it's mutually expected that it's mutually expected that everybody drives on the right. Here mutual expectation gives out at the third level. And remember, as we said, if you have common expectation, that means you have mutual expectation at every level. So if it fails at the third level, you fail to have common expectation. So again, we see that if we try to pursue this strategy of connecting convention to common expectation, we would correctly rule out this third counterexample. It would fail to be a counterexample to convention because we lack common expectation. And of course, the move is going to be the same in this hierarchy of cases. So we said that in principle, you could come up with more and more complicated cases. What's going to be more complicated is that, well, the next case, mutual expectation would fall at the fourth level, then at the fifth level, then at the sixth level. Lewis said that if you think about cases, if you actually got cases with that structure, you would want to say they're not conventions. Appealing to common expectation will help us here because if mutual expectation fails at any level, then it will fail to be commonly expected that the thing holds. So it will fail to be commonly expected that we drive on the right if mutual expectation fails to hold at any level. So that's in sort of a, a hand wavy way of indicating why appealing to common expectation is going to help. But we should actually now say, well, how does Lewis explicitly put this in his definition? And basically the idea is, well, we just get the old definition and say, well, not only does the old definition obtain, but it's also common expectation that it obtains. So here's how it goes officially. So imagine a population behaves in a certain regular way when they face the same coordinated problem repeatedly. We say that a regular way of behaving is a convention, just in case it's both true and commonly expected to be the case that everybody acts in that way, everybody expects everybody to act in that way, and that way of acting produces a coordination equilibrium. So we just get the old definition and we add on the condition that it's commonly expected to hold. One last thing we should do, so, so what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to spell out this connection between common expectation and expectation at all levels in more detail. But before we do that, I want to ask a very obvious question, which is, well, when you have common expectation or expectation at every levels, does that mean that you have these like really, really complicated beliefs? Because an obvious worry is that, well, if I'm required to have beliefs about what you believe about me, that I believe about you, what you believe about me, you might think, isn't it just very implausible that we have those kind of beliefs? I mean, I've never asked myself what you think that I think that you think that I think. I've definitely never asked myself what do you think that I think that you think that I think that you think that I think, and so on. But you might worry, well, doesn't the definition require us to have opinions about those kinds of things? Actually, though, the answer is no, because Lewis is, is sensitive to this kind of worry. He doesn't want to say that we should have these sort of really complicated opinions about each other. And the reason is because, remember what we said expectation was. We said that for something to be expected is for you to have reason to believe it obtains. But of course, we have reason to believe lots of things that we don't believe. We have evidence for lots of things that we just never bother making our minds up about. What well, we have reasons just in general to believe lots of things that we don't care about and so just don't form beliefs about. So for instance, like in principle, you know, every truth of arithmetic, maybe we have a, enough evidence. You could sit down with a calculator and work out for any given sum of two numbers what that sum is and have a belief about it. Maybe you have enough evidence to figure out what that is. 
But you don't have any of those beliefs, presumably. So by stating it in terms of what you have reason to believe, i.e. what you expect to be the case, rather than what you actually believe, Lewis thinks he's not committed to saying that you have these sort of very complicated beliefs, uh, these very hard, complicated higher order beliefs about each other. And that would be maybe a good thing. You might think, well, that would answer a particular worry that's going on here. I do want to caution, though, it's not entirely clear to me, at least, that this move of moving from belief to expectation really does the work. Because if you think about the original examples where the convention failed to obtain, it really seems like the convention fails to obtain because of the false beliefs that people have. And you might think that you could just be explicit in those examples that people have these false beliefs even though they have the ev enough evidence to form the right beliefs. So in particular, you might think that not only it's not just that I think everybody uh, is driving on the right out of habit rather than because they think everybody else is going to do that. I actually have evidence to believe that the correct thing, which is that it's happening by convention or that everybody expects it to happen, but I just ignore that evidence or I'm irrational in some other way. In that case, it could still be commonly expected that everybody drives on the right because everybody has the right evidence for those beliefs. It's just they don't choose to follow that evidence. But in such a case, I at least still get the intuition that it's not a convention. Because my actual beliefs are wrong, regardless about what beliefs I should have, because my actual beliefs are wrong, there's some inclination for me to say that it's not a convention. So if that's, the, if that's right, it maybe suggests that we really do need to be appealing to people's actual beliefs rather than their expectations, rather than what they just have reason to believe. Um, and if that's the case, it's unclear whether moving to expectation escapes this worry about positing really complicated higher order beliefs. So that's an objection I'll just leave there for you to think about how much you're really worried about this, what you could say if you were worried about this, and in the next video we'll try and spell out more the connection between common expectation and mutual expectation at all levels.